Hey everybody, welcome back. This is Kathy Randall from Synapse Care Solutions. This is another Monday live stream. And this week we are diving into part three of our series of Every NICU is a Neuro NICU. So I hope you've been following along all month. And if not, you can catch the replays right here on our channel. And don't miss the opportunity to earn free nursing CEUs and to download the workbook that goes along with these lectures. So this week, it's so important that we're diving into this topic around neuro protection. It is one of the biggest risk factors for babies, especially preterm babies in the nursery who get a primary brain injury. This is a huge impact on their long-term development. So when we can implement strategies to actually prevent these or prevent the extension of these or help to ameliorate or clean these injuries up, this is a huge opportunity for us in the NICU. Next week, part four is all about neurodevelopment. What are those things, those interventions that we can do to nourish and to nurture the neurons we do have? So this week is all about protection from that primary injury and extension of that injury. And next week will be all about the ways that we can enhance those neurons. So again, thank you for being here. Definitely grab the workbook and the free CEUs by clicking the link in the show notes below or scanning the QR code on the screen. With with that, I'll let you get started and I'll see you at the end. Thank you all for joining again. This is exciting. What I thought I would do for those of you who didn't catch the last time or if you had to jump off, I'm going to just share a few of the, just a couple recaps from last week and to reorient us and recenter us for where we're, where we're headed today. So um, first off, my name is Kathy Randall. If we haven't met, I'm so happy to be spending some time with you today. And I do a lot of international consulting and working in different NICUs. I like to say I'm a freelance clinical nurse specialist these days. And I do consulting work at various hospitals who have neuro NICUs. So that's the way I spend most of my time. And today's webinar is being provided by Synapse Care. And of course, as always, this is an evolving area. And we are going to talk about things that are, especially today, that are maybe a little off-label or yet not approved by the FDA and probably never will be, honestly, from the way our neuro NICUs and our NICU practice has been in the past, right? Practically everything we do is off-label. So we went through what is a neuro NICU, what are these four pillars of a neuro NICU, and then really how to begin to think about making change in your NICU, and we're going to talk a lot more about that at the end, because I really do believe every NICU is a neuro NICU, and depending on how you decide to implement that in your hospital, we can all do better at pushing forward and really creating the best team that you have to vent with your local team in your local environment. So we're gonna review a little bit of today. We're gonna to dive into neuroprotection, creating an innovative developmental care team. And then we're gonna end with just a plan for your next steps. So just the overall objectives, again, is just a, a recap. We've already covered the why, this trend of why we have neuro NICUs, but I'm gonna give a little recap of that. What, we've talked about the four pillars of neuro NICU care and some bedside practices. We're gonna definitely dive into a lot of this today. And last time we focused on neuro monitoring and we did a lot about AEEG and how to read that. So we're not gonna do neuro monitoring so much today. And then really the end of this and really my biggest goal of having these online courses and really doing presentations anywhere is really not to just share information, but really to make sure that at the end of the day, you have a plan of something that you can do in your hospital so that you can make one small change. And I think every big change starts with small change. And so what's one little thing that you can do to maybe tweak something that you're doing? And I, it does say here on the second bullet to really think about improving neurodevelopmental outcomes for babies but also thinking about emotional health for our parents, because we know that those things go hand in hand, and I'll share a few bits of data about that as well. So again, just as a recap, why do we have this trend of neuro NICUs popping up all over the United States and literally all around the world? Well, these are really the four things we talked about last time. We recognize that we're improving survival, but we're having increasing morbidities, and I shared a lot of data around that. So again, just go back and review those if you haven't seen them. Uh, we wanna take advantage of our local expertise. So no matter where you work, you have a team of people who have expertise. And so we wanna take advantage of that. 
whether that's through fetal medicine or your NICU team, or maybe you have neonatal neurology or neurosurgery, neuroradiology, everybody is focusing on the brain and follow-up care to get the best outcomes. So you wanna take advantage of your system and what's working really best for you. Then third is really bringing new care practices to the bedside, that translation of research. And then fourth is really improving outcomes. So we already know that we're improving survival. Now it's all about improving outcomes. So for infants and again, families. So when we talked about what is a neuro NICU, I shared with you my four pillars of a neuro nurturing NICU. And so this is really a way to think about this neuro NICU trend and translate it really to any environment where you work. And so we have neuroassessment, neuromonitoring, and then protection and development. So for neuroassessment, what we focused on last time were really the complications and challenges that we have around the clinical exam and how we really do need tools like some of the ones listed on the screen and some of the ones we discussed last time to help us have objective ways to talk about the infant's behavior, the infant's current state. And so the neuro exam is a powerful tool and one that is complicated by gestation, by medication, and just by skill of the caregiver. And so we talked through some of these challenges that we have around the neuro exam before. We talked about just the way that babies talk to us and tools we can use and skills we can develop that can help us to learn and to read these cues that babies give us every day. And we talked about how complex that is and how challenging it can be to really read these cues and then to provide interventions based on them. We spent a lot of time on brain monitoring, these tools that help us at the bedside that are used in conjunction with other tools that we have and that we want to use them because they provide us with real-time, unit-based, 24-7 information. We're not reliant on someone else to view these bedside tools. They're just like our heart rate monitors, our saturation monitors. These are real-time tools. We divided our neuro monitors into two groups, right? We have our cerebral function monitors, brain function, so activity, looking at EEG. And then we have our brain perfusion monitors, our near infrared spectroscopy or NEARS devices. We went over in a lot of detail the five patterns of AEEG. And just for those of you who didn't come, I just wanna make sure that we go through this because they'll be important later. There are five patterns. Remember, one normal for term babies, one normal for preterm babies, and three abnormal tracings no matter how old you are. This is a beautiful normal pattern for a term baby that has these amazing alternating cycles between thin and thick, thin and thick, along on the AEEG pattern where we have this upper margin above 10, a lower margin above five, except for when the baby goes into sleep where we see a shifting downward in a discontinuous pattern for about 20 or 30 minutes. Then we have that in between REM sleep, 30 minutes or so, and then a bouncing back down. We love to see these sleep patterns about once an hour. And we talked about the different causes, why they might be missing or absent or even just interrupted. We shared a little bit about the different patterns that we see for different ages. And so certainly we can use AEEG to look at background patterns and to help us assess the maturity of the baby's brain. So for today, with that little bit of a recap, we're gonna continue on with what is a neuro NICU. And we're gonna focus on pillar three and pillar four. So pillar three is neuroprotection. So with neuroprotection, we used to always talk about neuroprotection really as preventing injury and cell death. And so for today's talk, I'm gonna stay in that, that domain of prevention. But really what I'm gonna expand that, and when we talk about neurodevelopment, really now we use the term neuroprotection to really talk about both prevention of injury and promotion of optimal development of the brain. So neuroprotection really is both neuroprotection in the sense of preventing injury, but then also to prevent disabilities. Through our pillar four, through neurodevelopment, just to divide the two up, we're gonna talk about things we can do to actually nurture our neurons. So it doesn't matter if those are our immature neurons or injured neurons, 
we're going to talk about what are the things we can specifically do at the bedside every single day to nurture the neurons we have. So I thought before we dive into that, that I would just spend a couple minutes just setting the stage and talking about theories of brain development. And when we look in the literature, and this really goes for adults as well as, as babies, but super important for our babies. And we have these two concepts. The first is neuroplasticity, and the second is neural pruning. So with neuroplasticity, this is all about what fires together, wires together. So this is when we have a brain that is sitting there as kind of this unformed blob and mass, and it's waiting for something to happen. They call this experience expectant. So when we have experience expectant neurons, these neurons are just there and they're waiting to be fired upon. And the more they fire together, the more they wire together. So that means those tracks get stronger and stronger and stronger. So if you think about yourself and a habit that you have or a habit that you've ever tried to break, it's really hard to do, right? It's hard to do because that's, those neurons have fired together so long that they have wired together so strongly that you literally have to override your neural tracks in order to make a new habit. So when we talk about neuroplasticity, what we're talking about for our babies is that we're actually giving them experiences that may cause their brain to wire together differently than it should have. So this could be the fact that maybe they have early exposures to pain and that we disrupt some of these normal balances that are supposed to be happening in our neurotransmitters, but that we are actually causing neurons to fire and wire differently. So this is where that neuroplasticity, and, that, and plasticity really comes from the word plastic, right? So we think about plastic. You can mold plastic to any shape, right? It can be a sprinkler and it can be a shower curtain. Plastic can be anything. And so with neuroplasticity, we need to think of the brain the same way. The brain could be anything. And that as these experiences come in, these neurons are firing. These neurons that are firing are so important to the shaping of the brain. We also need, we have to have this kind of firing in order to actually generate synaptogenesis. So it's not even so much that we need it to create the pathways as much as it is that the brain is dependent on neuronal firing to actually create synaptogenesis, to actually create those connections in the brain. And when things are out of order or other parts of the brain are overwhelmed, we have dysfunction later. The second theory is this, neural, this idea of neural pruning. So neural pruning is really all about use it or lose it. So when we talk about, this is really experience dependent. So not so much experience expectant, like that the cells are like, I don't know what to do, I'm waiting. But it's more about it's, if we don't use it, the cells atrophy, just like muscles, right? If we don't use muscles, they atrophy. So when we have neural pruning where the brain is saying, well, what parts of the brain do I, are being used? Which parts need to really be focused on? And the other parts die away. So this neural pruning then happens as a part of neurodevelopment. So both of these are very important to the brain and even for us into our older life where we think about, right, everyone's trying to improve their memory and not have, not be forgetful. And so even this use it or lose it, staying active, doing crossword puzzles, doing Sudoku on your phone, whatever it is that you do, this is all about use it or lose it. We do not want to lose our brain power. All right, the other concept that I think is very important that we have to talk about when we talk about babies' brains is this idea about critical periods of brain development. So like I was just talking about how synaptogenesis is so important and it's happening all throughout these periods and the influences of the environment and everything that's happening really is, is important there. But the thing about this slide, and I know every talk you've probably ever been to talks about these critical periods of brain development, what I really mean about this is that these periods are open and closed. You don't get a chance to go backwards and redo some of these early phases of the brain development. 
So you'll see these things like primary neuralization, neuronal proliferation, neuronal migration. You see how they have this little discrete time? So I'll bring my pointer over here. So primary neuralization, right? That's that closing of the neural tube. If something goes wrong, we never get to do that phase again. Can we go and repair it and do all of our medical interventions? Absolutely. But we don't get a redo to reform that neural tube and that neural crest and all of what has to happen in that folding and zipping up, right? Same with the development of the cerebrum. If there's a disruption, we may have conditions like anencephaly or lysencephaly, where we end up with a problem in the actual development of this, the cerebrum and even sometimes the cranial vault. Neuronal proliferation. If there's a disruption that's happening, nutritional deficit, maternal stress, maternal disease, things like that that are happening during this very specific window, we may have a baby who's born with a smaller head. So we have things like cardiac anomalies where there's blood flow that's disrupted. We don't get to go back and rebuild those brains when those things are disrupted. Same with migration. Cells need to be born in that germinal matrix and migrate out and along those ventricle plates, out to the places in the brain where they're supposed to be. And if we don't have, if we don't have that happening, or if a baby is born early, we may end up having disruptions in some of these things. We have dysfunction in that way. You can see organization starts around five months and continues. This is where if we're interfering with the baby in the NICU and doing things that are painful and separating them from their mom and causing stress and other kinds of trauma, we can actually disrupt the organization of their brain because those brain, those neurons are wiring and firing together at this very critical period. So we just have this opportunity to really intervene and to realize that we're literally shaping these babies heads and their brains and their futures um, right under, under our grasp. So again, let's just recap. Neuroprotection then used to be categorized for only things that were there to prevent cell death. And we're going to talk about things that also prevent disability and promote optimal or normal development. And that's going to be in the development section. So prevention. So let's dive into prevention of injury because this is so important for us to know all the things that we can do at the bedside to help prevent this injury. So this is an old paper now, but what I love about it is that it was, the title of it says the whole story. Prevent brain injuries in very low birth weight babies through potentially best practices. So potentially, because we weren't quite sure, and best practices trying to say that this is the state of the art, this is what we know. So I think this was published, my little control is covering it, what is this, 2003. So these were the things that they were thinking or the best practices for us to do to prevent brain injury in very low birth weight babies. What this paper's talked about, which I love, is it gave us an idea, like a laundry list of the things that we could be putting together. And so probably many of you have participated in Vaughn and have done some brain bundles or some other kinds of quality improvement projects. And your quality improvement project probably included one, if not more, of these things on this list. So just to briefly go over them, things like antenatal steroids, optimizing delivery at a center where they have a NICU, making sure that we have direct management with neonatologists and NPs, managing pain and stress, developmental care, midline head positioning, optimizing management of blood pressure, hypotension, limiting postnatal use of endomethacin, optimizing respiratory support, so non-invasive ventilation support, limiting bicarb, and giving postnatal steroids very judiciously. So this is where a lot of the bundles that we've seen that have come out, they came from this, where people were looking at these potentially best practices and bundling them together. I still think that this is a good list, and if your unit is not really doing some of these things yet, you could go back and even pull the literature and just say, hey, come on, come on, friends. It's been 15 years. How come we're not trying some of these? or some of these things have now been proven to not be so helpful. So, so I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So when we look through the literature, and I just updated this list recently, 
there are many, many things, in addition to the things we just talked about, that, that could be helpful. So I divided them into meds and then bedside treatment, because I think these are the things that most of us have been talking about. So one of the things somebody had emailed in, they were a little frustrated that they had seen a decrease in the use of indomethacin and they, they felt like, well, what's going on? Why is that happening? Well, one of the things that they actually found were that because we were doing so much better with giving moms antenatal steroids, that when we combined that with postnatal or neonatal administration of indomethacin, we were seeing a lot more spontaneous intestinal perforations. So SIP, spontaneous perf, NP, no perf. Let's look at this use. When we look here on this graph, oops, there's my little pointer. We see that if indomethacin was given in the first three days of life with, and the mom got steroids as per ACOG and those other guidelines, right? Look at the, the rate of perf, 60% versus no perf if they didn't get it or sorry, just perf versus no perf, they all got the same meds. Same zero to 14 days, so if it lasted even longer, it's even higher risk. So this is what has been driving the trend of not giving so much neonatal endomethacin. So I thought this was interesting, I thought I would share this. So the odds ratio, this is the likelihoods ratio, so eight times more likely to have a perf versus if it went for 14 days, it was only four times, but still four times risk is really high. So anyway, so this is just showing postnatal steroids and postnatal endomethacin nowhere near when mom gets steroids. So this is definitely, and even if mom got steroids and tributylene, look at the rate. So it really was the endomethacin that was causing these perfs. So this is really what's been driving some of this trend. So then that means that from the literature, we can know that some of these things aren't really that helpful. It leaves us with just a few treatments, medication treatments that we know work. Mom's getting mag, mom's getting steroid, and potentially sedation for the babies. But this is like a maybe big giant question mark in my mind because sedation has its own set of issues, mostly that it slows down the brain, which slows down synaptogenesis, which slows down brain development. So we don't want that. So then that leaves us then to talk about treatments. And definitely there are many things in the literature that are supporting treatments that we can do to prevent brain injury. And here's just a short list of those. So let's talk a little bit about these. I think the one that gets the most play and the most attention is this midline head positioning. Even a recent Cochrane review talked about midline head positioning. Certainly it does not cause any injury. So I'm not quite sure why people are so in arms about it, but let's talk a little bit about some of its positive benefits. So most of the literature and most of the, the protocols that we see really talk about using midline head positioning for three to seven days. And this is oftentimes complicated by if, if a baby maybe does better on their belly and people want to do that, or some people ask, well, what about kangaroo care? So we're talking about babies laying in their bed and that when they're in their beds, we should be using midline head positioning. So midline does not have to equal supine. This is the other question I get a lot. Well, what do we do to prevent pressure ulcers and things like that? Well, we still reposition our baby. We just keep our baby in midline. So midline is nose, nipples, knees, toes. That is what needs to be in alignment. So it's not so much that babies must lay on their backs, that their bodies in alignment. So there was a recent poster presented at the Graven Conference in February 2017, and this is from East Tennessee Children's Hospital, and they did a bedside nurse-driven IVH bundle, and they did the 4B project, Building Better Baby Brains. I love that. And they actually had a list of 10 things that they did at their bedside. One of them was using a midline head positioner, and they actually showed comparing themselves year over year, prior to implementation of their bedside bundle and after, they showed a 48% decrease in all grades of IVH. This was an amazing outcome for them. They went from 21% of severe IVH to 10.9% IVH. 
And this was a big deal for them because in their unit, they were obviously having a big challenge with this 20%, right? So this was a nursing driven bedside initiative. And you can pull this from the internet, you can pull the full paper, and you can see all of their 10 things that they did, including blood pressure and I think two person cares and a lot of other things. But midline head positioning was certainly one of them. So again, as I was mentioning, just this essential positioning to maintain comfort for the baby. And not so much, I know that people oftentimes worry about this head positioning, turning the head. They worry about it crimping off the, the blood supply and then having a reperfusion injury. And although I think that there is a theoretical risk for that, especially for a baby who is lacking autoregulation and cannot compensate or extremely sick, what I really want you to think about is just comfort and alignment. And midline positioning is the position of default, even in utero. We don't have babies unless there are some sort of crowding situations have their heads turned. Babies have midline orientation for a reason. This helps to organize their nervous system. We also want them to be flexed and contained. And when I say contained, I mean 360 degrees of containment, not just something at their feet and not just something at their back. We need them to have full contact, full support in the bed. If they're outside of the bed, they're with mom and they're having that hands on, on usually from every which way. And if you use one of those kangaroo cuddler kind of a things, then they're going to be coming around them and having, giving them good pressure. But in utero, babies actually have three pressure points. They have the back of their head, their butt, and their feet. And when they're in utero, they actually are contained all around and they can feel those boundaries all the way around them. So when we actually look at babies who are arching their neck, who are pulling back away from the ET tube, they're usually looking for that back of the head boundary. So you can see here in this picture that you can see that there is this boundary right behind the head. You can see that the baby's feet are bracing against something, and you can see that the bottom is actually being snuggled by this little hand. And so you can actually give the baby pressure at those pressure points so that they can actually feel contained in their environment. So yes, in this position, they are also midline, but they are also flexed with orientation towards the center, and they're contained in that is causing them to be comfortable. When babies are comfortable, they have more stable blood pressure, more stable heart rate, more stable oxygen saturations. They are more stable. Those things are so important for them to have a lower rate of IVH. So is it truly the midline positioning or is it really good positioning that really helps to prevent IVH? I don't think we have the data for it, but we certainly know that when babies are more comfortable, they will definitely be having a better experience and then they will have better vitals and that is really going to help them. So again, keeping them contained. I mean, I think probably if you've been doing nursing for a while and you remember when we used to not have all these great tools to help us keep babies contained and midline, <clears throat> we'd have babies who would come back from break and they would move their way <clears throat> all the way across the bed, right? Their back, their head, something would be up against the side wall of the incubator or even the side wall of your radiant warmer table. These babies were looking for those touch points. They're looking for that containment so that they could actually find their way in the environment. So anyway, it's enough about that. And we talked a little bit about it before under assessment of what we can do. Um, last time we also talked about the IPAT tool. So the IPAT tool is an amazing positioning assessment tool that allows you to be able to quickly, objectively assess the baby's orientation towards midline, flexion, and containment. So you give a baby a score of zero, one, or two for these six areas of the body. And if their shoulders are retracted, they get a zero. If their shoulders are midline, they get a one. If their shoulders are rounded, they get a two. So just an easy way to actually give them a score. And you can use this as a quality improvement project and other things. We, we talked a lot about this last time and several people commented on what they're doing in their units to use it. So if we have midline head positioning, then the other thing we can try is to improve that auto-regulation, that, that ability of the brain to manage 
the amount of blood flow that comes to the brain by either shunting from the exterior or peripheral system into the brain and just improving that autoregulation so that as blood pressure goes up, you only have a mild increase in blood going to the brain and that we don't have an explosion, for lack of a better term. So one of the things that we wanna think about are just these daily practices like UAC sampling. And so what we know is that babies who lack autoregulation, who have a big surge or a bolus of, of fluid may end up over expanding their blood volume and then expanding that in their brain. And then that may be causing them to have a bleed. So many people have actually looked at the correlation between cerebral blood flow and IVH and PVL. And so we wanna know that if we have rapid withdrawal and rapid flushing, we can actually mess up our cerebral blood flow, velocity, volume, and oxygenation, which is, can be measured by that NEARS. So there was one study here that was looking at blood sampling, and you can see that when we looked at the UAC, that blood flow velocity was actually changed by that. So if they actually, when they withdrew, they actually had a negative 19% change in blood flow. And then when they gave infusion, there was a positive 10% change. And so when we were looking at mirrors and we're looking at tissue oxygen extraction, we can actually look when we took the same amount of blood and gave and withdrew that blood over 20 seconds or more slowly over 40 seconds. So 20 seconds more rapidly, there was a significant change in, tissue, in oxygen that was happening at the brain or if we went more slowly with our withdrawal, there was actually no change. And so this is the reference for that in case you're interested in that. So whether or not this actually causes IVH, but it's certainly, we know it's causing changes in cerebral blood flow. So we wanna make sure that we're at least, again, it's validating what we've known for years, which is go slowly. The other thing that was very interesting from this study, and I didn't include it on the slide, is that the volume was actually even more significant than the timing. So we should always still go slow, as that previous slide showed, but it's also important that we also use very small volumes. And so now we have some new tools for us that are available that also help us to use many infusions and, and many withdrawals. So just tiny, tiny amounts, mini sampling. This is a very messy slide. This is my actual handwriting. <laughs> I have one of those phones you can write on. So I'd taken a picture of this slide at a talk recently, and I just thought it was really interesting. So what this was showing was the mean blood pressure here was 22. So this was a 24 weeker, day two of life. So, you know, early on, no IVH, and they had a very low blood pressure. One in which probably most of us would have probably not felt comfortable. And here is the regional saturation of the brain. And what is normal for a preemie is around 60 to 80. So it was hanging here around 70. So quite normal for a brain saturation and oxygenation number. They started dopamine like most of us would to help improve the blood pressure because this feels very low, despite the fact that the brain was showing normal saturations. Okay, I'm just gonna say that again. So even though the systemic blood pressure was very low, the brain was showing good saturations. They gave dopamine, which would be standard of care, standard of practice. The blood pressure did improve slightly, but look what happened to the brain saturation, boom. So with NEARS, this is not always about oxygen supply, but also about, ox about perfusion. We caused a massive surge of perfusion to the brain. Eight hours later, they had got a ultrasound and the baby had had an IVH. So the question is, when we have bedside tools, do we maybe begin to refine and redefine what is hypotensive? Yes, there was systemic hypoperfusion, but the brain was doing well. 
do we really want to cause for these small babies this much of a surge in perfusion? At this point, when we, they corrected the blood pressure up here in just in 30, so this is 20, this is 30. So they had corrected the blood pressure not even by that much, but this caused a significant shift to the brain perfusion, almost to an over perfusion, over circulation point. And then there was a bleed. So is this causational? No, but it's certainly telling in the sense that we need to understand more about how we're really defining hypotensive. Is it significant? Is it truly hemodynamically significant if the brain is still perfuse? If the kidneys are still perfuse? If the baby's still making urine? If the color is good? Is that still hypotension? And should we, or should we and could we use some of our bedside tools, bedside brain monitoring tools to help guide us? So anyways, sorry for the messy slide, but I love this slide. All right, so number one was to prevent injury any way we can. Number two is to contain injuries. So if injuries have occurred, what can we do to reduce the progression of injury? And the most important thing that we can do right now is therapeutic hypothermia. And we're gonna talk for that for a very long time, so I'm not even gonna spend that much time on that. We can offer hypothermia two ways, body or head. Most people are doing body now. Some places are still doing head because they still own that device. Both head and body cooling have been shown to reduce death and disability. We know it doesn't help everyone. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So remember, prevent first. Second is to contain and restrict the progression of injury. Second thing we can do is really to identify and treat seizures. We know that seizures on top of an injury, right? So we didn't prevent the injury, but now we know we have an injury. So whether that's an IVH or it's an HIE insult of some sort, we know that babies who have had that insult and then have seizures have a worse outcome. The mechanism is not 100% understood, except to know that it's just a huge stressor on neurons. And so we know that these recurrent seizures, especially on top of an injury, are very, very telling of a poor outcome. The other thing we can do, oh gosh, I think this, those two slides are out of the wrong order. So we'll go back to more prevention then. So we couldn't, we're not going to contain, now we're continuing on with prevention. I don't know how those slides got moved. Number one is to just prevent common NICU complications. I'm so sorry. These are crazy out of order. Mounting evidence. So we want to eliminate infection and inflammation. So things that you do in your nursery. What are the things? Type it in. I've been talking too long already. You type into the chat panel. What are things that you're trying to prevent infection and inflammation. What are, what are initiatives in your NICU that you're already doing to prevent or minimize infection and inflammation in your nurseries? So either you can unmute yourself or you can type it in. All right, well, what about things like this? How many of you have an NEC prevention program? If you're with me in a room, we'd probably all be you know, waving your hands. Do you have a CLABC or a sepsis prevention? Yes. Of course you do, right? Ah, hand washing, exactly. Right, hand washing, central line bundles. Perfect, thanks, Cindy. So things like ventilator acquired brain injury. So you have a sepsis, but no, in any, not an NEC prevention. Great, I'm reading these for the recording just because the people, VAP bundles, right? So ventilator acquired pneumonia bundles. Yeah, we're doing all of these things every single day to prevent infection and inflammation in the baby's body. So most of us are trying to do something to minimize NEC, trying to do more breast milk, trying to do more human milk. We're trying to do these things because we know that these things, even just surgery, right? So they have neck and then they have surgery. We know that having surgery and then the inflammation that happens after that, all of those things cause an impact on the baby's brain development. Inflammation, infection, all shown to decrease neurodevelopmental outcomes. So when we do things like VAP bundle, we're actually, yes, we're trying to prevent infections, and infections are horrible, especially if they're nosocomial, but more important is the impact, the long-term cost not just the short-term cost and antibiotics and the baby being sick and having to stay longer, 
but the true long-term cost of these kinds of infection and inflammation, they seriously damage the brain. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about ventilator-induced brain injury. Yep, early breast milk feedings, exactly. All these things that we're doing to prevent inflammation, I love it. So ventilator-induced brain injury, this is when we have cerebral infl inflammation and hemodynamic instability, right? Two bad things for IVH as clear pathways of premature brain injury. So when we have mechanical ventilation, we know that that's gonna cause cerebral inflammation. So we wanna minimize mechanical ventilation. But how many of us think about that? We most of the time think about early extubations and using CPAP and high flow. We think of that mostly as preventing BPD. We don't oftentimes think about it as ventilator-induced brain injury and preventing cerebral inflammation and brain injury. The other thing is that the risk in increases proportionally with the intensity of treatment. So the longer you're intubated, the more times you're re-intubated, the more times you fail, those things all increase the risk for brain injury proportionally. This is a cool slide from that previous slide I was just mentioning. So this is the ventilator-induced brain injury in preterms in neonatology in 2016. This was a cool little graph that they had in there, and it showed these were all the areas of research that were happening around ventilator-induced brain injury. So these are all the mechanisms. So steroids, allopurinol, EPO, human, basically stem cell, and melatonin. Look at all the different ways. So they're trying to intervene at all these different pathways. So reducing inflammation, reducing hemodynamic instability, things that cross the blood barrier, blood-brain barrier that they think might help. And then look at all the other things. So we know EPO definitely is good for helping to prevent transfusions, but look at all the neurogenic behaviors it has, crossing the blood-brain barrier, reducing inflammation, reducing oxidative stress, reducing apoptosis, and again, reducing hemodynamic instability in the brain, right? So brain perfusion. So these are all these different pathways where people are looking at melatonin. Melatonin decreases inflammation. I mean, it really hits every single one of these areas. So these are areas, again, not ready for prime time, mostly in research right now, but people are looking at this ventilator-induced brain injury and what ways we can actually prevent more brain injury. Oops, sorry. The other thing that I think a lot of us have talked about over the years is deformational plagiocephaly. And I'm not going to talk a lot about it today. That could be a whole hour talk all in itself, but the head shape matters more than for cosmetics reasons. 40% of babies who have plagiocephaly require special, aid, special education services later in life. It's not just about molding. It's not just about head shape. It truly is that this misshapen, this shifting of the cranial vault actually molds the brain. The brain in the way that it should be connecting. Remember how things need to be connecting and firing and wiring and going the right places? Babies who have misshapen heads have misshapen brains. That makes sense, right? So misshapen head, we think about that cranial vault of our babies just being so fluid and flexible and you know that the brain still does its thing, but it actually doesn't. When it's constrained in a certain way, it actually changes the way that that migration should happen, those connections should happen. And that ends up having a long-term effect. So we need to think about what we're doing in our unit and are we even measuring? Remember last time we talked so much about, are we even measuring it? Do we even know what our current stats are? How can we begin to make a change without really knowing these things? Are we actually having a standard way of evalu evaluating head shape at discharge? Are we actually tracking our rates of plagiocephaly and then connecting that back to needs for services? So it's just another thing to think about is in that head, in that prevention of injury, what are we doing for that head, for that head shape? So that you can just, again, just think about it as a potential project that you could do in your unit. All right, so number two in our kind of pathway of neuroprotection, number two was that constrained injury. Number three, really, really quickly, is really increasing tolerance of the cells. So when, when Again, we haven't been able to prevent injury. We haven't really contained injury or that's not an appropriate move. We wanna think about what are things that we can do 
that will help the cells be more tolerant after an insult. Because certainly just the process of, of repair can cause some, some issues. So this is where when we do provide hypothermia, there are many pieces of research that are many projects of research that are happening to look at some different pathways to see if we can actually help those cells transition through that repair process. So we know that the injuries happened. We know that potentially in the, the repair process, there will be some additional inflammation and additional things happening. And what can we do to prevent injury, further insult and further injury? So helping those cells. So this is where the studies are looking at. And some of the things that are being studied, let me just move this so you can see them all. Things like EPO, we just talked about EPO for looking at the, the ventilator-induced brain injury. But other things, so we know that EPO is antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. We know that it can help these fragile cells. So we're looking at this. We're looking at giving hypothermia and giving EPO, high-dose EPO for helping this repair. Xenon is a gas that can be given alongside hypothermia, so like inhaled nitrous, nitric oxide as well as growth factors, stem cell things that they're looking at. So again, areas of research, but nothing that we're really doing much with today. The EPO study should be, should be done within the next couple of years, and we should have some long-term data very shortly, well, five years maybe, three to five years, to help us know what we can do for that. So I'll talk a little bit more about the EPO study. It's called HEAL, H-E-A-L, the HEAL study during the, the last part of the today. Let's see. Number four is really to salvage some injured cells. So we looked at that EPO and we looked at melatonin in that, that pathway for looking at ventilator acquired brain injury. But actually melatonin was actually looked at first as a medication that they thought they could maybe give preemies to help them not have white matter damage. So PWMD. So having that periventricular white matter damage. So melatonin. So they tried to give it, but it actually didn't prevent bleeds and injuries. But what it did show was that when they gave the melatonin, even though it didn't prevent the injury, the babies who got it, their, their brains actually repaired more quickly. So the, again, this is an area ripe for research. There's nothing we're really doing now. There's another study happening right now with melatonin trying to perfect this dose a little bit but definitely not an area that, that's yet ready. I put this little Fix-It Felix Jr. character here. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie, Wreck-It Ralph, because I like to just remember what is this really trying to do, salvaging injured cells. So in the movie, if you've not seen it, it's really super cute. It's a great movie you can watch. So Wreck-It Ralph is the bad guy. He goes around and he breaks things. This is a hero. His name is Felix, Fel Fix-It Felix Jr. So Fix-It, he fixes everything with his magic hammer. So Felix goes around and he actually, anything that R Ralph breaks, he uses his hammer and he goes bing, 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 and he actually fixes it. And so what we are looking for in this particular kind of research, we're looking for a magic hammer. We're looking for a drug, a treatment, something we can do that when a baby has had a brain injury, we can give them the magic hammer and it's going to go in and it's going to actually look for that area of injury and it's going to boom, 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 it's going to repair it. So that's really what we're after, is trying to find tools that will go in and salvage these injured cells, right? Because these are all things that we do after an injury has happened. I hope that makes sense. The number five that we wanna do when it comes to neuroprotection is to grow new cells. And, and I don't know, for a long time, I guess I was under the mis misunderstanding that we actually grew new neurons. I always just thought if you lose them, they're gone forever, that we don't actually grow new neurons. But there is a word for it. It's called neurogenesis. We actually do create new neurons. And so when we think about that, and then we're going to talk in a minute about nurturing the neurons we have, what are the things we can do at the bedside to nurture these neurons, not just prevent the injury, but actually nurture them? We want to talk about some of those things. So when we talked about in the survey some of your challenges, around providing good neuroprotection. Here's some of the things that you were saying. And again, I've already addressed some of these. So giving indocin, 
when urine output is low, can't give it. But there are other reasons we don't give indocin now, right? Starting cooling, that was a challenge and the right amount of times and giving good care. So these are all challenges that you guys mentioned to me. So of the stuff that we've talked about so far, what questions do you have? What comments do you have? What are you excited about? And you can either unmute yourself or you can just chat it in. So Kim, tell me more. How, so Kim's commented here that they're using melatonin, but not in that fashion. How are you using it, Kim? If you want to unmute yourself, you can. Oh, they don't have a mic. Okay. So one of your physicians really likes to promote sleep. Interesting. So you're using it for sleep, but not for, not for the like scavenging, cellular scavenging. You give it at night to your long-term BPD ears. Oh, cool. Do you feel like it helps? Wow, that's great. I love that. Well, it's certainly better than chloral and Ativan, right? No matter, no matter what. So the question was, what was PWMD? So it was periventricular white matter damage. So that was on the slide where we were talking about the melatonin here. So Kim followed up and said that not only do they use melatonin, but they use a lot of clonidine too on your vented and trach bed babies. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So one question I was going to ask you is just so that I'm sure that I, I get to everything that you want me to today. What are some of the most important things you want to make sure we cover today? Like what are some of your biggest personal challenges around neuroprotection and developmental care? And then if you want to type those in, because I want to make sure that at the end of the day, that I'm sure that I cover everything that you want me to cover. I was just looking here, Kim. Thank you for that. That's a really good, good one. So, so Kim wrote in the chat area, one of the things that was really important to her is just consistency and sustainability for interventions. Oh my gosh, I wish I had really good answers for this. They have a great developmental care team. They have great buy-in from her, but the buy-in on the nurse, the NNP, and the doctor level is an ongoing battle. So this is so, so common, so common. I'll see if I can give some ideas, but this is a really great question. And I'd love to know what you've already done to try to, to improve this consistency and sustainability. One of the things we talked about last week that comes to mind is just the measuring measuring and reporting and sharing. So if you can measure something with an objective tool, so no one gets their feelings hurt and spills picked on, right? If you can measure it, then you can maybe make some change. But I think until you measure it, it's really, really hard. So someone else is saying one of their biggest challenges is not providing comfort before IV sticks and heel sticks. Yeah, and we're gonna talk about pain. And we, and we haven't talked about sucrose as a potential area. And again, it's measurements, right? How do you measure that people aren't doing this? So either the documentation is there that can show you that they are or they aren't, or the, document, the documentation is sketchy and it's just our perception. And usually, just like eating right, our perception is that we're actually doing it better than we are. Yeah, and due to time involved. So the saying, one of the challenges is not providing comfort due to time. Yeah. I think that's, that's a mindset game, right? That's a culture game. That's a misunderstanding of what that pain really does to the brain and to that baby long term, right? We think of it as, oh, if I just do it fast I'm get, and I'll get done with it, it'll be better for them. That's what we oftentimes think. So these are great, yeah. So we'll talk a little bit about pain, and we'll talk a little bit about maybe some measuring matrices that we can use. If you think of other things, feel free to chat them in there. Okay, so Kim is also saying, Heather does positioning audits at the bedside, and we've tried multiple times to get people to document kangaroo care. Sometimes the audits go well, and other times they go terrible. The documentation has never been good, no matter what we've tried. Yeah, so one of the hospitals where I do some consulting work, we just added to our Epic the number of minutes of kangaroo care. 
because we were just marking kangaroo care skin to skin, yes, no. But we didn't really have a way of being able to measure the dose. So you have that and people still don't do it. Yikes. <laughs> oh my goodness, right? There's just, it's so hard, right? It's so hard to do this good work. Yeah, so you, so you have this great documentation. You've updated it, you've, you've made it so that it's super clear so that you can measure. I guess one of the things would be, just, would be to say is, has it been communicated that that's a priority for your unit, right? And you're measuring it, so you're doing audits, but are you tracking it? And are you telling people and you know, that they're not doing it well, but are you celebrating the successes, even if it's a 1% change? 1% improvement. Because I think that's one of the things as people, it's so noisy. Not, I mean, it is literally noisy in the NICU too, but I think that through email communications and different initiatives, I think sometimes we get lost about what's, what is most important. And until we really seal the deal and bake something into culture, we probably shouldn't bring on another project. But does that ever, ever, ever happen in the NICU? No, we always have some new crisis that has to happen and that we have to begin to, to focus on. And so we never really get to bake something truly into culture, except for that we will constantly be in change. So I think that's a, an ongoing NICU culture problem, and it's probably a hospital-wide problem. because It's probably happening in every department. But I think anytime we, we're not able to sustain something, long enough to really pull it into practice. Yeah, so tried and true. So try, you've so tried gifts, you've tried shirts, you've tried candy to try to get buy-in. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Usually candy and potlucks work, right, for every NICU. That's funny. All right, let's see here. So let's dive in. So thank you for sharing that. If you think of other things, I think we're going to get to some of this and, and we'll definitely talk about that more. All right. Well, that wraps up week three of Every NICU is a Neuro NICU. I hope that you've enjoyed this week's presentation and that we will see you next week as we wrap up with part four when we talk about neuroprotection. So again, hope you have a great week and thanks for being here. Don't forget to scan the QR code or click the link in the show notes below to get the workbook and the free nursing CEUs. All right. Have a great week. See you next time. Bye.